we're doing this to accommodate Mr. Brandt's right to a public sentencing. And because our courtroom's so small, we're accommodating that um, through having uh, the sentencing broadcast. So um, you are all welcome to listen in. You are not welcome to participate unless you're one of the uh, uh, people that Mr. Brandt has indicated he wants to have speak on his behalf. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is, uh, everybody I have to say was quite well behaved during the during the um, when I took Mr. Brandt's plea, uh, with one exception, which is that everybody was chatting with each other over the WebEx. Uh, you can't do that. This isn't a forum for you all to talk to each other. If my courtroom was bigger, you'd all be in here, and you couldn't yell at each other across the room. So the same rules apply. No chatting like that last one. And when we see that, those people are going to be removed from the WebEx. If this gets too bad, we're going to turn it off entirely. Um, now for the rules of the people in the courtroom. Um, I've told the sheriffs to remove anybody who makes a sound during this sentencing, other than those people, again, who are uh, labeled as witnesses, not exactly witnesses, people who want to speak on behalf of the prosecution, the victims, or who want to speak on Mr. Brandt's behalf. Anyone else is not only going to be removed, you're going to be kept in a holding cell until I'm done with my docket today, and I'm going to hold you in direct contempt, which means you'll do, I'm thinking about 90 days in the Denver County Jail. Again, I, I'm, I'm sorry I have to say this. I hope I didn't have to, and probably I didn't have to because everybody was quite well behaved during the um, uh, guilty plea, except for these chats that were going back and forth. So those are the um, rules. Oh, one other thing about folks in the courtroom. No cameras, no videos, no tape recorders. Um, the sheriffs have also been instructed that if they see any of that, you will also be held in direct contempt by me and also put in a holding cell till the end of the day when I will sentence you. And by the way, we have a big docket, so the end of the day is probably not going to be till 5.30 or so. <laughs> All right, those are the rules. Um, this is, I've already called the case, um, and is this Mr. Brandt? It is, Your Honor. I apologize. We were just checking in before court. Um, Cassandra McKenzie and Yona Porat, we are alternate defense counsel, and this is Mr. Brandt, who is out of custody. Great. Thank you. Um, um, we're flying without a PSI. A couple preliminary things. Um, I uh, did look at the 2019 Jeffco PSI um, and, at the, and at the Adams County PSI. I can't remember which one of those, the, one of you. I guess it was the people probably submitted, but I have read both of those. Um, and I will proceed like I always do in every sentencing, which is here first from defense counsel, but actually before them, if defendant has any people he wants to uh, speak on his behalf, since there are three, uh, are all three of the named victims going to address me? Your Honor, um Judge Andre Rudolph is going to address by the name of Emily Betts, who's a judicial assistant and clerk that will address the court by WebEx. And then I believe um, Judge Crespin will also address the court by WebEx. But so, not the other judge. Correct. So we have three victims that are going to address me. That's correct, Your Honor. So I am happy to hear from at least three folks if they want to speak on behalf of Mr. Brandt, excluding Mr. Brandt. Um, it's not up to you. We've now gotten volunteers uh, by chat. Again, let, maybe you're not hearing me. No chatting on WebEx or you'll be removed and locked out. It's not up to you to volunteer to speak on Mr. Brandt's behalf. It's, just on, it's up to Mr. Brandt to decide who to, um, he wants to testify. Um, so if we so let's start with those folks. Does Mr. Brandt have anybody who wants to speak on his behalf, um, either does. in person or remotely? So I have uh, as my first speaking witness Ms. Anita Springsteen, and I am not sure she is present in person. Okay. 
And then, Your Honor, after our witnesses, um, just a request of the court, is it possible for the defense to go second? I, I can't hear a thing you're saying. I'm sorry. Um, is it <laughs> possible for the defense to request to go second after the witnesses speak? It's possible to request, but that's not what we're going to do. Understood. Okay, who's the first person that wants to speak on behalf of Mr. Brown? Her name is Anita Springsteen, and she will come to the podium. All right. Good afternoon, ma'am. If you would please start by telling us your name. Yes, Your Honor. Should I keep this on, or? It's okay with me, but why don't you keep it on, and then if we're having trouble hearing you, you can lower it. Okay. That's start with your name, if you my would. Concern. My concern. My name is Anita Springsteen, Your Honor. What would you like to tell me? And um, so I want to... Uh, introduce myself. I'm an attorney and city councilor in Lakewood. Obviously, I'm not here in an official capacity, but my experiences as an elected official do shape my views. Uh, you know Mr. Brandt? I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, recently, a former city councilor who doesn't like me very much sent an, sent an email to all of council, which was surely forwarded to many constituents, it said, I should, quote, be punished in every way possible. Given the nature of her politics, her, her known racism, her anger towards me, uh, and the fact that this was shortly after the riots in the Capitol, I took it to be a threat to my safety. A Jeffco judge would not give me a protection order on this as she did not find the threat to be imminent and a Jeffco DA found no criminal wrongdoing after the former counselor denied any ill intent. Nobody in the system felt this former city counselor's words rose to the level that she should be punished. So I don't want to interrupt, ma'am, but we're not here to talk politics. We're, I'm not interested in your situation. I want to hear what you have to say about Mr. Brandt. Okay. If you don't have anything to say about him, we'll move on. Okay. Um, what, what I wanted to get to is that Mr. Brandt is a veteran who gave eight years of his life in the military and took an oath to defend the Constitution. He's become a crusader for justice in recent years, driven by his disgust with the injustices he sees all around him. Many people turn to him for advice, solace, protection. He's like a father to many of the most oppressed members of our society, and he wants to help each and every one of them. Uh, in January of 2020, uh, we went through a life-changing experience in that, uh, and again, this is a personal experience, but it leads directly into how I know Mr. Brandt. Um, my boyfriend, Jeremiah Axtell, who was restrained and cooperative, was arrested and forcibly injected with ketamine in front of me, the same way Elijah McLean was given ketamine and died. My boyfriend also died and had to be revived. Um, and that experience completely changed my life and goals to want to go towards civil rights. So Elijah McClain has become a symbol of excessive use of force and racist policing in our country. Uh, in the months following this police assault on Jeremiah, I was confused about how to address it and frankly terrified because it became apparent that my own city was going to come after me. And uh, that was when I first met Mr. Brandt. He, he helped us go through the medical records and figure out what had happened to Jeremiah. He put us in touch with multiple people who became part of a team of folks that's determined to end this barbaric use of ketamine in the state of Colorado. But perhaps most importantly, he, he put the story originally out on YouTube and made it public. And for the first time after that, did I feel any sense that we were safer from harm. And for those things, I'm grateful to him. I, I don't endorse everything Mr. Brandt says. I know that he pushes the limits, but I ask you to consider his state of mind and his character I've never known him to be anything but gentle. I believe that he has been fighting a war for the Constitution and for justice. 
And with, as with any veteran, he has PTSD, he has flashbacks, he has, he's in recovery from this battle. And this is where he might at times sound angry. Uh, but his frustrations, I believe, actually stem from his compassion for people who have been mistreated or wronged by the justice system. And being on that battlefield over the years, I believe, has made him feel helpless to stop it, which has led to certain outbursts. But they are words. And one of the most emotional moments I've seen Mr. Brent have is when a blind man in another state was mobbed because of his protesting. Mr. Brandt couldn't stand the lack of humanity toward that disabled man. And really, I think that's what drives him. I think it's a wish for humanity. And, you know, this nation has recently had a reckoning about the need for justice reform at all levels. It's no longer a question of whether there's a problem, but how we go about fixing it. Many have just joined in that battle over the last year, and their frustrations are not questioned. Mr. Brandt has been embroiled in this for years. He's tired and war-ridden. He's tattered and torn, and he's ready to pass the baton to others who have the energy for this movement, I believe. I hope this court will allow Mr. Brandt to move on with his life and contemplate how to help people in more cerebral and productive ways. And he has people around him who are trying to help make that possible. Uh, I believe locking him away in prison will help no one, but he may just be the reason many lives are saved if he's per permitted to help in new ways. I point to the case in conclusion of Hunter Barr, who's a 24-year-old kid that died from forcible injection with ketamine in Colorado Springs in September. He should not have died, that kid. And many of us were working very, very hard for many months to prevent that death over the past year. One of those people is Eric Brandt. And I, I would just implore you to let him help us stop the next Hunter Barr and Elijah McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Springsteen. Your Honor, the defense would next call Jeremiah Axtell. If you'd start with your name, please, sir. Yes, sir, my name is Jeremiah Axel. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to drop your mask if you wouldn't mind. And oh, by the way, I should have asked everyone. I'm happy to wear one if, or do people want me to wear one? I have shots and everything, and I'm really far away, but I'll wear one if you want me to. Anybody want me to? We don't have All you have to do is raise your hand. Okay. What would you like to tell me, Mr. Asphalt? It, it's actually, sir, everything you said plus two, but it's a different point of view from my perspective. Uh, I have a checkered past and I have instincts that don't match most people's until I met this guy and my world changed. I guess the best thing I could say right now is it would be a shame to take him off of the streets. Thank you. I love you, man. Thank you, sir. Um, and finally, Your Honor, on WebEx, we have Dr. Glenn Mears, who is Mr. Brandt's treating therapist. All right, doctor, we'll, um, if you'll start and we'll see which one you are and then we'll unmute you. Your Honor, my name is Glenn Mears. I am a licensed clinical social worker, actually. I am a, a mental health therapist. I have 20 years experience in treating dual diagnosis and substance abuse. I am a former director of the um, crisis team for uh, Golf Bend Mental Health Mental Retardation in Victoria, Texas. And my career has been dealing primarily with individuals who are in distress and seeing them in emergency rooms, jails, prisons, et cetera, for um, crisis situations. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. So. Um, in my treatment with individuals, I use the National Crisis Prevention Institute's model for de-escalation of behavior. And what that stipulates is if I'm anxious, that means I have an increase or a decrease in normal activity. When that happens, if I don't put a stop sign there, I go to the next level. And that is becoming defensive. 
That's when I say or I do things that are out of control, and often I do not remember sometimes what I say or do. If I do not put a stop sign there, I act out. When I act out, other people usually take control. Often that means going to the emergency room, being evaluated as whether or not someone's a danger to themselves or others, and if they are not, they are discharged into the community. The most important thing is when someone regains control, according to this model, is respect and dignity should be coming back to that person. We have to understand individuals with mental illness, dual diagnosis, are not able to turn on and off like a light switch their moods. I also use the Maslow model for motivation to change. It says that if your basic needs, food, clothing, water, and shelter is not met, you can't move to the next level of feeling safe, having a place to live in a secure environment. If that is not met, you cannot have socialization. You do not have friends, you do not have family, you cannot connect to others. And oftentimes when people have mental illness, that is the first thing that goes their support systems. The next step is self-esteem. After all of those things are met, I'm actually able to feel good about myself and respect myself and honor myself. If that is met, then I go into self-actualization. I'm gonna quote Maslow. A music man must make music, an artist must paint, a poet must write if they want to be happy. What a person can be, they must be. This is self-actualization. Finally, mastering who I am, end quote. The impact with those with mental illness is dramatic. Eric has what we call dual diagnosis, mental health, and a prior history of substance abuse. When substance abuse is prevalent, you cannot treat the mental illness. However, we have a system that's unjust I feel, as a clinician, having gone to the emergency room to try to get people committed that have alcohol or substance abuse is almost impossible. But without resolving alcohol and substance abuse, you cannot treat the mental health issues. Eric, at the time that he is being charged, had very traumatic life experiences. He was homeless he um triggered the flight mode the flight mode is when you are out of control so if i'm anxious and i don't get support i'm defensive and i don't get support the natural response of the person is acting out eric felt that he needed to act out during these incidents the other thing that we look at when we're committing people for mental institutions or when someone's destable is what is their plan? What is their intent? What is the lethality of that? And is it possible for that individual to carry that out? If those four factors are in place, I as a therapist, clinician, can file an M1 on that individual and put them in the hospital. When individuals are arrested, they normally go to the emergency room to be evaluated versus a jail. They're normally not charged with criminal behavior. They're placed under custody of a mental health and they have a mental health evaluation done to determine if they are a danger to themselves or others. They're not thrown in jail. Normally people who make threats do not carry those threats out. It appears that Eric, as many who I've been treated on this in the past, had a break from reality. Again, the M1 criteria is that a person is actively a danger to himself or others. Currently, Eric is not in distress. He has resolved some conflicts in his life, and he's moving toward more self-actualization. When Eric is arrested, he has gone through multiple stressors and legal issues. He's been arrested, incarcerated, 
posted bond, has been drugged through court day after day after day, has given up all his fight for perceived justice. His track record for winning cases is quite impressive. He has not given up battles in the legal system. He was offered and accepted treatment when he was incarcerated. He completed the program with significant progress while incarcerated. He identified some basic needs. He suffered from homelessness. He suffered from substance abuse. He's overcome these issues, and this is significant for his rehabilitation. The sole purpose of incarceration is to rehabilitate, not punish. Eric is moving forward with his life, wanting to resolve conflict of the past. Incarceration and solitary confinement secondary to the COVID virus is deplorable. Eric's mental health treatment is active. He wants to prevent further altercations with his perceived enemies. And he has moved to the country to avoid interactions with those he perceives as tyrants. Your Honor, I would encourage and recommend that Eric be given probation and be able to continue his rehabilitation in the community versus solitary confinement for having a period in his life where he was mentally unstable. Your Honor, thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you. All right, defense counsel. Your Honor, is it okay if I stay seated just so I'm near the Please microphone? Please, if you get really close to the mic okay. like this. So I wanted to let the court know that he has 85 days of pre-sentence confinement credit. Um, Eric is very much a changed man. Let's use last names, counsel. Uh, Mr. Brandt, it, um, I will try to remember that, is very much a changed man from the man whose actions form the basis of the counts in this case, which all happened, I think the court can see, fairly close in time. He has been on probation now in Adams County for several months, since January 8th. In that time period, not quite four months, he has gone from maximum to minimum supervision on their caseload. Um, he is completely compliant. He has moved many hours outside of the Denver metro area. Um, he spends his time primarily right now building a teepee that he's planning to live in. He's been working on himself. Um, he reminded me just a few moments ago, this started when he was in custody. He was in custody in Jefferson County at the beginning of 2020. He asked himself to go to the behavioral health unit. After he was released from custody, he began working with Dr. Mears, or, or I'm sorry, Glenn Mears, who the court just heard from. Um, He's been working on his anger, on his mental health. He has been making progress in therapy. And he frankly understands now that there are different ways to participate in the system, to object to perceived abuses that are not only more appropriate, they are also more effective. Um, Mr. Brandt turns 50 this year, so it's a big year for him. He has been sober for just about two years. He is very proud of that fact, what it means for him, what it has changed for him. I think he will likely talk to the court about that. He is someone who is uniquely and very much so interested in taking advantage of any programs or opportunities available on probation. In fact, I can tell the court that he applied for and was accepted into the Jefferson County Veterans Treatment Court. That was our, our preferred sentence, but the judge there did not deem that an appropriate sentence. But I just, I bring that up to let the court know the intensive amount of um, probation Mr. Brandt is willing to commit to at this time. He wanted to do high intensity supervision. Um, I think that the court can see a lot of dismissals and acquittals in the criminal history. I counted about 35. And Mr. Brandt has used this as a mechanism to advocate in a certain way. But over the course of this last year, he started thinking, what if I went to law school? What if I went, if I tried different avenues to pursue the things I am interested in? And frankly, that's part of why we were so hopeful for Veterans Court, because we thought that might provide an avenue. Um, he's business savvy. He is adept at navigating sort of the white collar in a world, or white collar world in a way that um, I think he lost his way for a little while. Uh, he got lost in terms of how he, he was conveying and expressing his message. Uh, I know he would want me to extend an apology to any victims that are here present on WebEx or in person. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt. 
Council, but we've just been advised that this is being broadcast on YouTube. And all I can tell you is that's um, not acceptable um, to me. Um, and this is a strange world we're, we're living in. Uh, if it were up to me, of course, we wouldn't be on WebEx either. These are small courtrooms. We'd, cr we'd be crammed with as many people as could be filled in, and the rest wouldn't hear what's going on, and that would be fine with me. But we can't cram people in here because of what our bureaucrats have told us about spacing. And so I have reluctantly agreed in order to preserve Mr. Brandt's right to a public proceeding to put this on WebEx. Um, you, the people on WebEx are not permitted to videotape, are not permitted to live stream on YouTube, are not permitted to do any of those things. And if I wasn't clear about that, I apologize. If this YouTube keeps going on, we will go dark on WebEx. And I'll give you five minutes to turn that off. Go ahead, Council. Um, so Mr. Brandt was very interested in Veterans Treatment Court. Um, I know that Ms. Porat has some, um, some things prepared to speak to this court briefly about how Mr. Brandt does on probation from the perspective of his previous supervising officer, who is um, Mr. Aaron Moon. He was supervising an Adams County case, but he's based in Jefferson County, confusingly. <laughs> um, and she has some more thoughts also from his case in Adams County, just briefly. Okay, counsel. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Mr. Brandt was sentenced in January in Adams. Mr. Brandt was sentenced in January in Adams County, and the district attorney on that case had been working with Mr. Brandt for four years and is very familiar with his circumstances. And so I thought that she was very well spoken at that sentencing. And there's a couple things, um, some passages I wanted to read for the court from what she said. With respect to other things that I think the court should consider, mm -hmm. the court is aware that Mr. Brandt has been on a deferred judgment and sentence with the diversion program in Jefferson County. His client manager is a man named Aaron Moon. Mr. Brandt, I'd ask, Ms. E Ms. the district attorney, Ms. Easton, reached out to Mr. Moon and asked, is Mr. Brandt noncompliant? Is he disruptive? Does he yell? Does he throw things? And Mr. Moon said, none of those things. And our time supervising him, he has been polite, he has been appropriate. Not only has he engaged in treatment as we've requested, but he actually signed himself up for more treatment because he was excited about those opportunities. Separately, Mr. Moon said that Mr. Brandt was cooperative and had a good attitude, tried all the programming, that he, he completed all his UAs, that he, was, uh, he did everything that Mr. Moon asked him to do, and anything that he, that he did do, he was upfront and honest. When Ms. Easton talked to Mr. Moon about what is left, what else can we do, Mr. Moon's suggestion was mental health. Mr. Brandt, she went on to say, Mr. Brandt presents as a veteran. I think that's significant. He is a man who served his country. When he returned to, I guess, civilian life, he was plagued by homelessness. Whether it's a chicken and egg situation, I don't know what begets what. We have a pattern of homelessness, drug abuse, and mental health issues, and then a history of trauma for Mr. Brandt in terms of his prior relationships. More than that, Mr. Brandt sits before the court, a man who is a minority in the sense that he is a homosexual man. And I bring that up because I think that all this, these personal characteristics go to the heart of the case. We have a man who had some mental health issues, a man who doesn't think and feel like everyone else, a man who committed himself to the armed service for the benefit of other citizens. He came back and he experienced hardship. But when you're voiceless and unseen, you feel different than and you're suffering from mental health issues and you've given to your country and received no acknowledgement or return investment, that can be difficult. My hope is that Mr. Brandt sees that you don't have to respond to abuse of power with more power. So that is why I'm requesting a community-based sentence with an emphasis on mental health. And the court went on to say, I don't think that prison accomplishes much of anything other than removing you from the public so you can't harm people for that period of time, punishing you, and maybe sending a deterrent message. Those are important, but it seldom rehabilitates an individual. And there are better ways to do that. And you seem to be committed to that. You're getting counseling, and you're moving yourself to more remote locations so that you don't get tied up with the same individuals or the same old thing. I think that's a good thing. This is all in the front range where all these cases are. Um, and Ms. Easton had asked the court to consider that all of these three cases were pending at that time, so they were considered in the sentence. 
And again, that's why we're here on this case. So having considered those factors, I do think an appropriate sentence is a probation sentence. I do think that it should be fairly lengthy, lengthy four years. And Ms. Easton closed with, that after Mr. Brandt came back from the services and he, he wasn't feeling heard, um, that she thinks that he struggled with power in a way that a lot of people struggle with power. She said DAs struggle with it. There's a sort of group sense. Anyone who receives any measure of power struggles with that. I think that, I think that this case was a reflection of that. I think this case is a reflection of a man who was unseen, who became angry, who fought back, who was a warrior for social justice, but let it go to his head. There's an argument, certainly. I'm not saying that there's not. And, and sentencing is in the court's purview. You can certainly incarcerate him. But the thing that I kind of go back to, and I think over the last few days in particular, I've gone back to, is a reflection on the Reconstruction era in American history. We don't have to, nor should we gouge. We don't have to hobble a man to find justice here. We don't have to do that. We don't have to use the prison system in an answer to this conduct. The conduct is criminal. The conduct is human. The conduct can be corrected because we've identified at least an option for solving it. So from my personal perspective, I don't think a prison sentence is necessary. I don't think it's warranted. I don't think that we need to deepen distrust and hate. This country is more tribalistic than anything I've ever, than I've ever seen it. It's incredibly disappointed. And unless people stand up and walk towards the middle and say, I see you, I don't need to cancel you, I don't need to throw away the keys and throw you in prison, I don't need to defund these people. I recognize there are good people. Unless we all get somewhere where we can recognize the humanity in each other, I don't know how we move forward. So that is my reason for not requesting a prison sentence in this case. And the last thing I wanted to say to this court is that last week I saw Mr. Brandt. I casually asked if he would be going to the protest that was taking place last weekend. And he said, no way, absolutely not. And I said, why not? Isn't that your thing? He said, I'm done doing that stuff. Not because protesting is bad, but because I'm not gonna put myself in situations any longer where I can get into trouble. I have my rock out in the country and I intend to stay out of trouble. And so we do ask this court for a probationary sentence. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I just had a few more things to say. Um, I think the court can see that Mr. Brandt witnessed some pretty severe abuse between his parents and his childhood. I would ask the court to take that into consideration um, in terms of how we got to where we are today, as well as sort of the responsibility he had to raise himself, frankly, even after his family sort of dramatically escaped his father. Um, the courts heard about his military service. I also just wanted to share with the court, you know, Eric, sorry, Mr. Brandt has an amazing knack for winning people over. Um, he is fiercely, fiercely loyal. And I think that at times, as in these cases, that has certainly led him to unhelpful and problematic choices. And he knows that. Um, but he wins people over. And I think he can prove to this court that he can comply on probation. As an officer of this court, I believe Eric can be managed on probation. He does not need to go into incarceration. The community is safe. He's doing well. Um, and as the court can remember from our plea colloquy, he's the one driving this today. He wanted to come in. He wanted to take responsibility. He wanted to apologize to his victims. I know that was important to him. And he is asking for your mercy and a chance to prove he can do well on probation. So that's our hope of this court. Thank you, counsel. Yes. All right, my staff informs me this is still being broadcast over YouTube on something called, I've never heard of, The Eric Brandt Show. Uh, we are going that's, dark that's now. That's my channel, and I am not broadcasting. Right, I know you're not. You obviously are here. Somebody by the name of Jam Freeman. We are going dark on the um, web now. I, I assure you, I'm not broadcasting. No, I know you're not. You're standing there. Yes, sir, did you want to say something? Your Honor. Yeah. I have reached out to that broadcaster and they have killed the feed. I have confirmed it in the hallway. Still going. Confirmed it's still going. Are you behind a few minutes? It could be delayed. Uh, we'll give it a few minutes before we go dark. We did. Thank you so much, sir. I, All right. I don't know how someone can be broadcasting on the people. <clears throat> um, do the people have folks that want to speak to me? I, 
We do, Your Honor, and my concern is that two of those witnesses are on WebEx, so if we could have those hear from them first in case you have to go dark, and then we could hear from Judge Rudolph. Yes. So I believe that the first witness um, that wants to speak is em Emily Betts, who should be present on WebEx and can address uh, Judge Hoffman. All right, Ms. Beck, can you hear us? Um, yes, it's Emily Betts. Um, what would you like to tell me, Ms. Beck? Well, I appreciate your time and hearing me speak this afternoon, Your Honor. Um, I just want to start out by stating that I honestly believe that I became a victim that day for, for one simple reason. That Judge Crespin and I chose not to recognize Mr. Brandt's attempts to bully us in the courtroom. Mr. Brandt expects to be treated differently when he enters a courtroom. He was treated no different than anyone else appearing in Judge Crespin's courtroom that day. What I was faced with that day is something I will never forget. And it serves as a reminder that on any given day, our lives could be in danger. I received a death threat over doing my job that day. Mr. Brandt believed that Judge Crespin and I both deserved to be shot in the head. The fact that Mr. Brandt responds to authority with death threats is something that speaks volumes as to the kind of person he is. It is no secret that he presents himself in a very confrontational manner anytime he sees an opportunity. It was clear he was there that day to derail the jury trial. When Judge Crestman did not tolerate his bullying, he turned to violence and death threats. I want Mr. Brandt to know that the impact of a death threat, ha that the impact a death threat has on someone is not a joke. And your words do have consequences. Calling for the shooting of multiple judges via YouTube, hoping someone acts on this call for action is very scary. I have a family that I go home to every day when I leave work. I am a person, not just a judicial assistant. Having to call my husband and father to let them know that my life is in danger is a phone call no one should have to make. I am thankful that this was taken seriously and charges were actually filed. I cannot thank the DA and the Adams County Sheriff's enough for handling this case and supporting Judge Crespin and I when we needed them the most. Your Honor, I believe a DOC sentence is appropriate in this case, and I think you will hear plenty of other statements that will support that as well. And thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Next. Your Honor, I believe that uh, former Judge Crespin is also on WebEx and would like to address the court. Judge Crespin, can you hear us? Judge Crespin, I think you may have to unmute. Let me remind people who may have joined us lately, you are not permitted to use the chat system on this WebEx broadcast. And that's because if you were all jammed here in the courtroom like you should be, you wouldn't be permitted to yell across the room, it's disruptive and it's gonna stop or we're gonna go, we're gonna remove this WebEx. This is a sentencing hearing, not a political rally. Your Honor, perhaps we can move on to Judge Andre Rudolph and see if uh, we can't then get Judge Creston. <clears throat> All right, Judge Rudolph. Good afternoon, Judge Hoffman. My printer wouldn't work, so I decided to put send it because it just wouldn't work, so I can't get it out. Would you be kind enough to lower your mask? I'm having oh, some trouble I'm hearing you, sir. I can take it off, Judge. That's great. Appreciate it. So being here today is actually kind of odd, weird, but... 52 a.m. Judge Rudolph, you're a fucking piece of shit. 
You're the biggest fucking piece of shit that courthouse has ever seen. You better fucking resign before your next election. I'm going to drag your shit through the mud. How dare you commit acts of violence demands for flipping you off? I'm going to fucking flip you off every fucking time I has been terrorizing Denver County Court for a while. I thought I was going to be different when I had his case. I thought because I understood perhaps what Mr. Brandt was going through, protesting, being homeless. Because what I know is that I wouldn't be in my position if it wasn't for people protesting out of the South and fighting for rights. So when I first met Mr. Brandt, so people wanted to tell me about him, I would ask them not to, because I wanted to be fair, I wanted to be impartial in terms of his cases. And it was all fine when he got his way. When he got in an argument with the city attorney when I first had his case, they didn't want to give him the discovery even though he was serving a sentence and claimed that he was indigent. City attorneys also wanted to fight, or at least that particular city attorney. I that was wrong. Give him his discovery. He is indigent. He's not earning income. He's in jail. Give him his discovery. It was all fine and dandy. Apparently, one of his folks, YouTubers, followers, he sends me a, which I didn't find, but a recusal request. Get off my effing case, you effing liar, blah, blah, blah. I didn't have grounds to get off his case. Spoke to the presiding judge, and I said, there's no legal reason. And she said, just get off. Trust me. I said, but it's about the law. It's about being fair. It's about what I should do within the law, because that's my oath. It's the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Colorado. And I figured I could be different than all of the other judges, because I felt like I had a sense of what he was fighting about. That wasn't the case. So I got off of his one case, I think it was one in front of me. Didn't have much interaction. Then all of a sudden, when one of the other folks does something contemptuous in court, he decides that I guess it's time to rally. The first time in terms of this was him out in Lakewood. It's interesting that there's a person here from Lakewood that spoke. He's pounding on their door, posting a video on YouTube and ridiculing them. But he finds time for dear old Judge Rudolph, who he says should go fuck himself, do us all a favor, whoever the us is, kill myself. Now this, is not a political statement because I know you don't want that judge and I'm not going to give you one. But as a black man born and raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming, who has been called the N-word and coon and all sorts of other derogatory things in Cheyenne, in Laramie where I went to University of Wyoming, in Omaha where I went to law school, and even here in Denver, to have someone on a video say, wouldn't I look good hanging from a tree what he said in a video posted on YouTube about me. I've never heard those words in my life. Even my first case as a public defender here that I ever took the jury trial in front of Judge Marcucci, gentleman's name was Michael Cullen, case is long gone, who used to call me his coon lawyer. I represented him. So I told him it was about the law. It wasn't about him being a supremacist is about the law. That's what you say every time I came out. <clears throat> so I heard that. It was investigated. District Attorney's office, so there's nothing here. The speech, it's not enough. Even though it might be hate speech, and yes, we get it, because that envisions those things that black folks in the South, 
That's what would happen. That's what it was. My grandmother raised me up at Cheyenne, Wyoming. She fled from the South because of that. She grew up picking cotton. So I know those images. I know what it's like. I've seen those images. And I thought, how dare you? I don't even have your cases. She asked me to recuse, which I didn't want to, but I did. And then ultimately, we get to more stuff. There were other calls that were made, Judge Hoffman. Then we have more stuff where he sends to his friends. It's taking a little bit, Judge, to just load up, but. You ready? This is Judge Rudolph's courtroom, right? That's correct. Yeah, I wanted to share my thoughts and prayers for Judge Rudolph. It's my thought that Judge Rudolph should be violently murdered and have his brain blown through his head. And it's my prayer that somebody actually does it. I conclude. Would you be sure to share that thought and prayer with the judge? And who is this calling? I'm one of the people. Do you need to know any more than that? Do you need to know any more than that? I'm one of the people. All my calls are recorded for my Fucking spoilers, Michael. So, I'm sorry, you still haven't given me your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I required to give you my name for you to pass that message along? Well, I might go ahead and have a call. Oh, you would? Tell an occupied Denver call. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are? No. But you can tell him that anyway. So, it is my fault. The judge threw up should be violently murdered and have his brain splattered all over the face of his children. And it's my prayer that some motherfucker actually does it. Do you have any more questions? Kill, kill, kill. All judges should die. Kill, kill, kill. Kill, 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 kill. Do you have any questions? I'm asking you a question. Do you have any questions? No, oh, you should actually be dead. Be dead. Oh. Goes on. I finished the busy docket that day. My clerk, Mr. Foy, walks in. The look of horror is something I've never seen with him. When he's telling me and my other clerk, Ms. Abeda, about this phone call that he just had with Mr. Brandt. For what? Because you want to broadcast on YouTube, and because you think that it's okay to threaten and then say, that all judges should be killed, all. Mr. Brandt, with that call, doubled down. And just to share these thoughts, and then I'll be done, Judge, because you have a busy day. For me, a judicial officer's life should never be threatened, period, end of story. For me, it's that plain and it is that simple. Words have meaning. Words have consequences, and when certain words are spoken or phrases are used, they're not protected under the First Amendment. I'm a big First Amendment proponent. The United States Court has also, the Supreme Court has also said and stated, you just can't say whatever you want to, anytime, any place, anywhere. There are limits to your First Amendment right. As a judicial officer, when I accepted this position, I expect criticism. I expect for rulings to be ridiculed by one side or the other, and sometimes even both sides, when you make rulings. Sometimes people don't get exactly what they ask for in your rulings. I understand anger, frustration, sadness, sometimes even joy, depending on who you rule for. All of those are perfectly legitimate reactions. Are judicial officers perfect? No. That's why we have a United States Supreme Court. We make rulings that maybe people disagree with. I get appealed by district court. I get reversed. I get affirmed. 
But that's the process, is appeals. When people go on and say you're stupid and all that stuff, okay, it's fine. You don't like a judge's behavior, et cetera, there's a process in place. Disciplinary commission, performance commission, things of that nature. You want to talk about their demeanor, their temperament, their smarts, whatever. By no means do you get to threaten the life of a judicial officer, officer because you're unhappy with his or her ruling on your case or on somebody else's case, period. I understand mental illness. We deal with it in the courtroom to where I am assigned day in and day out. So many folks experiencing homelessness and trespassing. We deal with it all the time. Kept thinking I was going to be different. When he says this is Judge Rudolph's court, isn't it? And he says, and he doubled down when Mr. Foy asked him again, that not only should I be violently murdered, it is his thought that I should be violently murdered and have my brains blown through my head, and it is his prayer that someone actually does it, as we just witnessed his is on YouTube. This is being broadcast. It may not be Mr. Brandt, who may be all these other things I hear, good and quiet and acting out and quaint. I call crap. May not be him, but it may be one of the thousands of followers who decide to do that to carry out his thought and his prayer. And then to have that be a lasting memory, just in case he wasn't clear enough, that my children be next to me when that happens. So that they have that lasting memory in their head of their dad being violently murdered because it is his thought and his prayer. When I didn't even have his case, it's the case of one of his YouTubers that he got so upset about, came in to interrupt the court to bring in 100 pennies and sat in the jury box in front of me with a shirt on, with a finger, as they kept going in. They know, because he is well settled in terms of what we do in court. He knew he shouldn't be in there. He knew we don't take bail bond money in there, but it was him to disrupt it. So much so to the point that even while he was visiting on another YouTube video, because now they're telling me about all these threats that keep coming. Visiting, I guess I think it was his mother, in maybe South Dakota or Montana or someplace, that's on YouTube. He's still got a special word for me. I'm a POS, they're gonna post my address and can I come to my house and protest me? My neighbors don't deserve that. My family definitely doesn't deserve that. It's my job. All I'm doing is my job. Never called Mr. Brand a name. Never actually really ruled against him if I didn't have a chance, even in that frame. But he decided that that's what should happen to me as a judicial officer. Later on in that call, which I stopped Judge Hoffman, my clerk asked him about identifying himself and he says, we, it's, at one point he says, I'm part of the people. Then he says, you tell him it's Occupy Denver. And then as Mr. Tafoya knows his voice says, Mr. Brandt. He says, I didn't identify myself. He says, well, you've called here plenty of times. And then he says to him, well, so what? What are you gonna do about it? You aren't going to do a damn thing about it. That's part of that call too. And by the way, that call was sent to one of his people who then had the phone up while they're posting on YouTube, letting that call play. While they were talking about people that got arrested down here in the courtroom. You aren't going to do anything because he doesn't believe that there should be consequences for him at all. He operates in a different sphere. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. So while he's up in visiting mom, he then decides to then again start talking about me. Then he thinks he finds a person while he's in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is also a YouTube video. So I'm born and raised, he thinks he finds a person who is my brother or father. He thinks it's my father. It's actually my brother. See, my grandmother raised me. I was adopted by her. So all those uncles and aunts became brothers and sisters. He doesn't know that. He wants to go visit 
Henry Rudolph, and he puts that on YouTube. My brother Henry Rudolph is one of the meanest, baddest individuals I've ever met in my life. You talk about doing some time, five to life in the Utah State Penitentiary. Probably a good thing you did not run into him because he loves his little brother. And at that time, he was living with his, my other brother. I wonder what would have went down at that point in time. Because that guy does not play, does not, has never. But this was yet again, I'm going to go tell him what a, not even understanding the danger that he was probably putting himself in, and maybe even my family, up in Cheyenne, because it became this game that was also on YouTube. When you think that it doesn't get worse, we then started getting more and more calls that same day and later on. We then had a call from a guy from the, I got a call from the Larimer County Sheriff's Department of a guy who then goes on and says some of the same things about how I should be violently murdered and whatnot, and they asked me if I want to prosecute. Yep. You got a prosecutor, they want to file charges, do the same thing that Denver was finally brave enough to do. And by the way, I have to say, Judge, I believe that Denver did it first, then it might have been Adams, and then Jeffco. Pardon me for interrupting. We're getting yep. chats. Remove those people. Yep. Go ahead. And when you have to go, and I saw the look on my clerk's face, and you have to go and say that to your family, and you got Captain Jordan from the Sheriff's Department coming in, seemed like weekly, with different things of videos. When you have to go, you have to explain that to your daughters who are home. My son, my son's old enough. I had to explain it to him. He's up in Cheyenne, but I'm pretty sure he handled himself if something like that happens. But you still have to tell him. You still have to be aware. I changed the way that I would drive in. The police put up a halo camera in front of my house. There were officers when I opened my garage in the morning, officers out front, officers watching, and I didn't really want to alarm my neighbors, so I never really told them until they kept saying, man, there's a cop car out in front of your house. There's cop cars in your back. What's happening? And then I have to tell them. You know, I get his service to the country. Eight years as a vet, I get it. My pops, who was a guy called Pops, while I was in Omaha, who was one of my dad's friends, did two tours in Nam. I love Pops, and he's still alive. I honor that service because I think it is those folks who fought for us, the reason that I'm able to even stand here, the reason that other people protest. But words have meanings, words have consequences. When you use them loosely, and when you spout things off, and I know, Judge, you don't want to hear about insurrection and politics, but those words had meanings. Those people acted on those words. And that's the problem, is that I don't know which one of his followers is going to act upon his words to do what he wants them to do. There's a gentleman that stood up and said, hey, he was a lost soul, and Mr. Brandt helped him. His ability to befriend people, and he is fiercely loyal. Well, that same fierce loyalty, the ability to friend people, to have people follow you, could end up having me dead and killed with my brains splatter on my daughters because of his words. Now, I don't know necessarily, Judge Hoffman, what is an appropriate sentence, and I by no means is going to sit here and tell you how to do your job because that would be inappropriate. Because I know for years you've done your job vehemently, appropriately, loyally, 
and always there for the people and under the Constitution that you have so sworn to uphold. I know that. The thing is, is what do you do with someone who espouses those things, who says those things? And if it then happened, I guess his thought and prayer was carried out, but he didn't have anything to do with it publicly, but privately, maybe through YouTube and all that. He's like, yeah, I'm glad that MF is gone. He was a disgrace, as he said. He's not smart. He's stupid. All of these things. If I would have been found hanging from a tree, I guess he would have been okay with that, too. You don't say those things. Those are not things you should say. And when you say, I heard counsel say, oh, well, he is fighting with PTSD and homelessness and mental health issues and those things. And he's a homosexual man. Um, I got friends of all sorts of different backgrounds. And if he understands that of being in that minority, then he should understand the color of my skin. And when you say that somebody should be best, look best looking hanging from a tree, it's a racist statement. It's a violent statement. It's a terrible statement. When we talk about blowing brains out. It's ridiculous. I don't know. You hear behavior now, compliance now. What was all that before? Did somebody turn over a new leaf? I don't know. He's moved far outside. But what about the folks who are still here today defying the very order that you just told them? What about the fact of kill, kill, kill? All judges should be killed. All. Not just the ones who don't have your case. All. For what? Because you cannot operate within the bounds of the law and peacefully protest and raise your issues without inciting violence. For what reason? Last week, and I'll close with this, because there was something else he said on the video when he thought he had found my dad. Something about bone cancer and that he hoped that my dad would suffer with that. And he hoped that relatives, that should be on me too. My dad was an old protester at Colorado State University. He started the Association of Black Students there. He protested, there's a scholarship in his name there, under his name. When Al Yates was the president of CSU, the first black president of Colorado State University, he invited my real father back, and I didn't meet him until I was 15. He invited him back to re-engage with the school and recognize the history and those people that fought for social injustice and equality. My dad instilled that in me after I met him, which is even more goes to why I would understand what Mr. Brown would have been fighting for. One of the last things my dad asked me, and I lost him last Tuesday, April 21st at 5.30 a.m. to cancer. Prostate cancer, not bone. So he asked me, whatever happened to that guy who made those threats against my son and my grandbabies? One of the last things he asked me, I said, Dad, he pled guilty. There will be a sentencing, and I hope you'll be alive to know what happened. He's not, but he will understand and know what happened. And he never left a phone call without asking me about this case. I appreciate your time and your patience, Judge. I appreciate the time and patience of the district attorney's office and the fact that they actually decided to do something about this behavior. And with that, I'm going to take a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Rudolph. Do we have Judge Crespin back yet? Yes, Judge, can you hear me now? Yes, what would you like to tell us, Judge? Thank you, I appreciate your time. 
And I want to um, share some of the thoughts that Judge Rudolph expressed. Um, I, as a minority female uh, in the legal profession, know a great deal about uh, discrimination, knowing a great deal about having to fight um, to even get the similar same type of treatment as other people. So I understand the thought process. I understand the deep-rooted desire to fight social injustice. And I wholeheartedly believe in everybody's constitutional rights, First Amendment rights to speak your mind and say what you want to about social injustice and whatever fight it is that you're fighting for, because I think that's a necessary part of our society. But that's not what we're talking about in this instance. I guess I had the misfortune of trying to provide an individual that was charged with a crime with a fair trial, a trial that Mr. Brandt was not involved in as a witness or the defendant. He, I think, shared the same attorney that this individual had that was on trial and decided to show up for the trial, which is something that we all welcome, an open and public trial. However, as a judge, you're uh, job is to make sure that everybody gets a fair trial and to ensure that there is appropriate decorum in the courtroom. And Mr. Brandt uh, decided that was a perfect forum to um, engage in, in what he believes is social justice and to criticize the police department. Um, that does not make for a fair trial for anybody. Um, and in attempting to ensure and maintain decorum for that individual, for them to have their day in court, um, I attempted to do that. And in doing so, uh, it was broadcast on YouTube for individuals and followers of Mr. Brandt to come to my courtroom, bring their guns, and shoot me and my division clerk in the head uh, when he was asked to, to maintain appropriate courtroom decorum. He wasn't kicked out of the courtroom, um, just asked to be quiet so that the trial could continue. Uh, the next day when he shows up with his uh, associates carrying boxes of materials, that sort of thing, into the courtroom, um, created quite an unsettling and unsafe feeling, not only for me, but for my court staff, as well as the other individuals in the courtroom. Um, and asking him to leave the courtroom, uh, he proceeded to go outside and scream uh, to whoever was listening, individuals walking in and out, um, again, advocating for me to be harmed, advocating for my family to be harmed, um, and advocating for other individuals to do this harm. And we say a lot of times that words are just words, they don't cause harm. However, as Judge Rudolph was indicating, and as counsel indicated, Mr. Brandt has a large following, as we can see here by the in number of individuals here on uh, WebEx, uh, close to 400 individuals appearing uh, in support of Mr. Brandt. Well, those supporters actually picked up the phone, um, calling my division, making additional threats for my harm, threats to harm my division clerk, who I guess had the misfortune of, of drawing that trial that week and being in the courtroom where Mr. Brandt um, decided to show up that day. And those words do have consequences because I, like Judge Rudolph, had to be escorted to work every day, in and out. Police officers sitting at my home uh, 24 hours a day. My children had to have police escorts to school, police escorts to classes, to sit in the schools for their protection. So words do have consequences. When you're fighting for social justice, I think that is a worthwhile cause and something that is very necessary in our society. However, when you're advocating for death of individuals that have no connection to you for simply doing their job, you may not like their how they do their job, but that doesn't equate to advocating for harm to come to those because while words don't harm, the individuals who are receiving those words will engage in that and did engage in that as it did in my case uh, to me and Ms. Betts. And it is very difficult to make those phone calls to husbands and wives and children that now they have to be on alert for somebody that they don't know who this person is, who their followers are, who their associates are at every 
turn every waking hour and even in the evenings. It's just, it's unfathomable to me that, that, that that sentimentality is out there, that they're just words because they're not just words. They have real consequences and people acted upon those words uh, and made additional threats uh, to me and my staff and my family. And it does have consequences. And I think it's really important to, when looking at the totality of the circumstances as Mr. Brandt has, and, and I, I would applaud him for the work that he's done. However, um, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize and the court should recognize that he was on a deferred for this exact same type of behavior up in Adams County. The fact that he has three additional cases for exactly the same conduct sends in a very unique message that he just doesn't get it and the escape and the excuse that it's just words or no harm come it's not just words it created a significant amount of cost to the community it cost uh, personal pain and anguish to the victims myself included my family included that's just unnecessary. Advocate for social change, but when you advocate for indiscriminately killing judges just because you were upset with the system, that's not the way to do it. So, Judge, I do ask you to take that into consideration, the fact that he was on a deferred for the exact same behavior, and I understand that that judge gave him probation, but <laughs> I think it's just when you're advocating publicly on YouTube with as many followers as he has, there's no knowing where those words are going to land and how that's going to play out. So I just ask the court to take that into consideration in fashioning a sentence today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. O'Connor, what would you like to tell me? I do have one anonymous letter uh, due to safety concerns that I'd like to read as well um, as part of my sentencing argument. You know, I'm not sure that's appropriate. What about the right of confrontation? Uh, I, I I'm uncomfortable with Your, that. Your Honor, I know in other circumstances, um, courts have allowed it. I do think it would be helpful to the court. I, I don't see this as the right to confrontation in a sense of a trial where it's a sentencing hearing, and certainly yeah. I'm not cross-examining witnesses. For the defense, I indicated to defense, I'd certainly be happy if they wanted an additional witness and the court would allow, but it was not an actual witness that wanted to speak. It's just a letter that I was hoping to incorporate as part of my argument. No. I'm not letting these hundreds of people, uh, half of whom are anonymous, uh, and half, by the way, of those are keep keeping uh, sending chats, even though I've told them not to. I'm not reading any of their chats. I'm not paying attention to any of their chats. Um, this is not a place for anonymous people to uh, give me their thoughts. I don't care about their thoughts. Go ahead. Your Honor, and just so the court understands the context, uh, it was. Uh, we were contacted in advance of the sentencing, uh, and it's a judge who didn't, wanted to remain anonymous. No, you know, I'm not anonymous. I'm the judge that's about to sentence Mr. Brand. If this judge doesn't have the courage to tell us who he or he or she is, I'm not willing to listen to him. Okay, Your Honor, thank you. Your Honor, just um, to put this in perspective, based on the parameters of the plea agreement, uh, the defendant is enhanced uh, and was on a DG at the time. Uh, so it is two to six on each count, a total of two years to 18 years in the Department of Corrections. He's also eligible for community corrections and is certainly probation eligible. Your Honor, as many other judges across the state, uh, like yourself, have awesome responsibilities. In criminal rotations in particular. Do you have an issue about the? I do think that minimum is incorrect because he was on a deferred judgment. I believe the minimum is one. It's not a midpoint aggravator. It's just enhanced. It's a. It's enhanced, yes. So then one to six. One to 18. One to six on each count. Yes, okay. I misspoke. Thank you, counsel. In criminal rotations in particular, you make decisions like the one you will need to make today and it affects people's lives and affects people's liberty. And you decide whether Mr. Brandt gets probation or up to 18 years in prison. The nature of these decisions is inevitably emotional and cause angst and disappointment. To loved ones of a defendant where the judge chooses incarceration, it infuriates, it causes hostile reactions as this court has seen for years. On the other side, when the court gives leniency or community supervision, it can enrage families of victims who want punishment and are still hurting. The court has seen these emotions, has been a target 
has been a channel for their rage, yet you have to be trained to ignore it and to rise above it as you often do and as Judge Rudolph talked about having to do. But here what you have is Mr. Brandt, who Judge Rudolph was ordering members of Occupy Denver out of the building due to a report of jury tampering that led to a mistrial. He's a member, Mr. Brandt, of that Occupy Denver and his friends were affected. A minor grievance in the whole scheme of things of what the court sees and about how people are affected by decisions that judges make. And he chooses to threaten Judge Rudolph over this and invite all his followers to act violently against Judge Rudolph. He prides himself on being civic minded and affecting change in the process. So influence others to vote out Judge Rudolph, report it to the Judicial Performance Commission. But every time he feels slighted or his friends are slighted or called to task, he chooses threats and advocates violence and followers are listening who hides behind the First Amendment, but this is not protected speech. His actions are criminal and he has admitted guilt and now he must be punished for it. When the court accepted this disposition, we submitted a PSI that the parties agreed upon as far as his prior history and social background. We gave limited facts uh, as part of the admission to the factual basis. And I believe with respect to the incident in Denver, with Judge Rudolph's statement as well and his victim impact statement, the court has heard most of those facts. The only thing I would highlight for the court is that on December 19th, the next day, he posted Judge Rudolph's home address to his followers. And then again, there was a discussion on December 20th with Eric Brandt's YouTube posting about rifles and discussion of Judge Rudolph's daughter and wife. Then there was on December 21st, the call to action in Wyoming with a family member who he believed to be related to Judge Rudolph. And then you heard about the threats before any of this escalated. But when he said that about Judge Rudolph, he also incorporated what a disgrace to the judiciary when he asked what he would look like hanging from a tree. In Jefferson County, the court heard uh, some of the factual basis at the time of the admission, but again, threatening Judge and I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, Majid. Uh, I'm coming for you, what the fuck? You need to think about what you did. This is what I advocate, is the killing of random cops and judges. The reason is to shock you into compliance. So if you don't want violent end, I am prophesizing, then you should do something about it and stop acting so fucking stupid. I hope somebody blows her brains out. The judge was visibly upset and requested extra patrols. The court has heard too some of the context regarding the Adams County incident on December 2nd, where Judge Crespin and her clerk, uh, Emily Betts, and then Deputy Bonder was a, a sheriff's deputy who was a witness. There was discussion uh, in his uh, YouTube stream by Mr. Brandt with his followers imploring them to fuck Joseph Bonder in the fucking eyeball with a hot poker. Then he proceeds to target his words towards Ms. Betts calling her names, talking about somebody should push her down the stairs and give her a real reason to cry. He continued then to target Judge Crespin. And maybe it's time to give them a reason to cry. Bang, 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 just like that. According to Brandt further, that Judge Crespin and Ms. Betts should be afraid for their lives because people need to start killing them. On December 3rd, there was another YouTube uh, stream that was outside the courtroom. And again, threatening that Judge Crespin should die and his wishes and prayers again, that somebody blows her brains out. He identifies himself as a dangerous weapon. The defendant then further tries to interfere by telling the de deputy bonder not to testify during the trial the next day. You should call in sick, you don't wanna to testify tomorrow. Threatening again, interfering with the judicial process. It is noted from Adams County prosecutors that within 17 hours of that video that he posted, it had been viewed 3000 times. The defendant further announced to followers that he thinks Judge Crespin should die and he wishes and pray somebody should blow her brains out. 
That was when he identified himself as a dangerous weapon. In the law enforcement that was following this and trying to protect those that were involved in this process, there's attributes that within five hours of that video that he had posted that it had been viewed 1,573 times. These aren't just words, but again, calls to action for people who are blindly following Eric Brandt to act on violence against judges and others. It goes on where there's another incident at the IHOP where he's posting a video, again, calling to action for the killing of judges, police, and stupid bailiffs. So that's the conduct that the court has before it. And his behavior is to blame for it. And he has pled guilty to serious criminal felonious conduct where he's no longer hiding behind the cloak of the First Amendment. And he needs to be accountable for those decisions he made, not only to threaten three judges, deputies, and staff in three different jurisdictions, but that he advocated and took further steps to advocate that that violence be acted on. It not only affects the personal safety and emotional well-being of these judges and other court professionals and law enforcement, but it threatens the integrity of the judicial proceedings. The court heard how great the personal impact was, so I will not belabor it, but I think the victim impact here is important for the court to, to consider. My understanding as far as uh, Judge Majid is that um, she was scared badly and had extra patrols around her home and her family had to leave town as a result of these threats. The court has obviously heard the powerful words from Judge Rudolph and Judge Crespin and uh, Ms. Betts. Uh, to me, the most relevant sentencing theories for the court to consider with respect to Mr. Brandt today is rehabilitation, deterrence, and incapacitation. What we would implore the court not to do is to impose probation assuming that the court is considering it for a variety of reasons. One is for what purpose? What, what are his needs that the court can sentence him to a probationary sentence that will rehabilitate him in the community? As Judge Crespin pointed out, he was on a felony deferred judgment at the time that he committed these offenses. That particular, I know there was a reading by defense about what Special Prosecutor Kelly East, Easton had said, and, and Judge, I understand, I've seen this court before on a first revocation of a DJ, giving a defendant an opportunity with perhaps a punitive sanction of jail or not, re-granting the ability to be on probation. So that's, so that's understandable in that particular case, but not in this case where you have this multiple felony level conduct, which is very similar. The court did not have a summary of what happened in that case, which is the 17 CR 1584. But he was angry with Adams County District Court Judge Catherine Delgado. What, and he said at one point on his Facebook page, what do you think would happen if I threatened to blow up the Adams County Social Services building? I know one thing is for certain, they should really pay attention to what they are doing because eventually somebody's be pushed too far and take the law into their own hands. He then went on the next day uh, in, a, in a Facebook post specifically saying about the constant worry of death is more than pain and torture than death itself. It goes on. Again, he threatens Judge Delgado uh, in that particular case. So it is very similar conduct and he hasn't learned and he continues to threaten judge and call for action in three separate jurisdictions. I, from experience, I know that the defendant's criminal history does not always play a large role in this court sentencing. But one thing I would note for the court is that Mr. Brandt has repeatedly, and in one occasion in this case, introduced his whatever 30 page criminal history to show how many times his cases have been dismissed or been found not guilty, which is highly unusual for a person to gloat about that extensive arrest and criminal history. But what the court has here is that by my count, he has at least 12 misdemeanors or city convictions for various offenses, including assault, disorderly trespass, harassment within the last 10 years. Co coincidentally, around that same length of time, he has been unemployed. There does not appear to be any reason why he 
does not work. He is capable of working. He, he is educated. Uh, by accounts, I would, didn't have a chance to read all of the mitigation, but he should be working. He's not working. He's not being a productive member of society. As far as the veteran aspect of it, there was no request for him to do veterans court probation here. There was no screen. There was no ASR. Uh, and honestly, we don't believe that probation is appropriate here. Mental health, I do not see, nor have I seen before the court, an actual diagnosis for Mr. Brandt. There was some reference in the PSI that a follow-up mental health evaluation was going to be done with respect to that special process. But I don't believe that the court has before it that he has an actu actual legitimate diagnosis to be, to be treated through probation. Substance abuse treatment. He came into this court and told Judge Ellis he doesn't have any problem with drugs. He doesn't have any problem with meth. Judge Ellis took off the condition for random UAs and, and monitored sobriety. Now the probation PSI uh, tells a different story and suggests that he does need high level treatment for meth use, um, but he says he doesn't need any treatment. So the court should not give him probation to address his treatment that he's not willing <laughs> to address and doesn't need to be addressed because he's now sober and doesn't need any treatment. He has been given numerous opportunities at probation and supervision, and he cannot behave or be effectively managed in the community because he committed these offenses while on that level of supervision. Again, probation also unduly depreciates the seriousness of these offense and the multiple offense. To put him back on probation where he committed multiple similar offenses with escalating and targeting three judges and other court staff in three jurisdictions would be irresponsible. If the court, which we implore the court not to, is seriously considering probation, there is no limit on the length of time that the court could impose probation for. If the court is seriously considering probation, we'd ask the court to impose a 10-year, maybe even a 20-year sentence. Because what people want is Eric Brandt to leave them alone, to let them do their jobs, to let the civic civic experience take its course, to let the criminal justice system work. The criminal justice system has enough issues right now with the pandemic and a number of other issues. That's what people want, and that's what I hear from, is that people want him to leave them alone. How do you ensure that? One way, the only way you could do that if the court found a probationary sentence is appropriate would be for a significant length of time. I would also implore the court, if the court seriously considers giving him probation, to give him a 126-day recon. He needs a punitive sanction related to this case. But again, I'm going to go on to why we do not believe that probation is appropriate. The defendant's lack of remorse is an additional factor I think the court should consider. At every turn, he has not had any appearance of remorse or regret. Anything is disingenuous or hollow or non-existent. He has not shown any empathy for the actions that he has taken. There was a very hollow, he apologizes today, and that's it. If he doesn't acknowledge that he did anything wrong, how can we have any hope that he's not going to continue to make the same decisions that he did? That is concerning to the people to have any assurance that he will behave in the future. Incapacitation is an applicable theory for the court. It would be the best tool to achieve that he does not disrupt the system, that he does not continue to thre threaten people and implore violence against those who work in the system. People who are just doing their jobs day in and day out. It would ensure that he not interfere with the administration of justice that, again, has all those challenges. And it also would be punitive, which would be appropriate. Another appropriate theory that we would ask the court to consider is deterrence to warrant a prison sentence here. We need a substantial prison sentence to deter him and others from this course of conduct that places judges and their staff and their families in danger and the whole criminal justice system in danger. This defendant, Your Honor, deserves to be punished for his conduct and for threatening and advocating that members of the judiciary or their staff be harmed or killed. <clears throat> Brant's threats and his call for action by his followers who blindly follow him to commit violence on judges and their families, it is time for Eric Brandt to be held accountable, Your Honor, for his actions. Thank you. 
Mr. Brandt, you have a right to speak to me before I sent you. Is there anything you'd like to say, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Um, you can do it from there, but it might be more comfortable at the podium. What would you like to tell me, sir? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, I, first, I, I will apologize for disruptions with the WebEx, and I will ask the court to be patient with that because not necessarily all those people are on my side. They may be deliberately trying to disrupt. I'm not holding you responsible for anything they do. Okay, I, I will tell you that I have asked if, if I have followers, which I think is a little lofty, that if I have followers, then I would expect that they're behaving, and I appreciate that as well. And I thank you for opening the WebEx for this hearing. I think it's obviously an important day and an important question. Um, first of all, I, I drove this plea agreement. I want the court to know that. I think that my attorneys did a great job. I think that they mounted great defenses. I think there are perhaps legally defensible questions associated with these cases. And, um, and I think that, that my need to accept accountability for the fact that words do have meaning was outweighing any of those potential legal remedies that, that I might be able to enjoy. And um, I, I would argue that, that I have shown in the last year and a half that I'm capable of towing the court's line. Um, I, uh, I, I don't know how many days did you say we had credit? 85. Well, I have 85 days of credit for time served. That reflects the fact that it took some time for me to revoke my bond and, and start earning that credit. I actually was in custody for uh, nearly six months. And um, <clears throat> while I was in custody in Jefferson County, I took advantage of their behavioral health unit services. And I did that as a voluntary thing. I was completely compliant with that. We were driving towards a veterans court solution, uh, which we did not seek here. Um, I, I'm not sure why we did, but that, that's fine. Um, but in fact, <laughs> sorry, I was in fact accepted in Jefferson County for their Veterans Court program. Uh, they have resources available for me. They have educational resources available for me. And some of those resources could include uh, law school, which I realize is a large hurdle for somebody with a felony conviction, but it's not an impossible hurdle. Um, <clears throat> I, I took advantage of those programs. I was 100% compliant. I never even had so much as a verbal write-up the whole time that I was there. When I got out of custody a year ago, um, I sought the treatment. I sought Mr. Mears. Mr. Mears is in my area. I have moved out of the Denver metro area. In the time that I've been out of custody, I have, made, uh, I have achieved stable housing. I have achieved a property that I'm trying to build. Uh, it's 35 acres. Um, I have uh, achieved a much higher degree of mental health. At the time that these incidents occurred a year and a half ago, uh, both of my parents were in dire medical condition. As um, Mr. Rudolph indicated, that I went to Montana because my mother was on a ventilator. I do think that, that, uh, that the mortal condition of my parents was a major factor. Um, and I will also say that uh, I've not discounted a, a, a substance abuse question. That's not a question. The, the question was not, do I, did I have a substance abuse past? The question was, has it been addressed? And that question has been addressed. I've been sober for nearly two years now. So would I be objected to uh, the substance abuse treatment? I'm not sure. Um, the, the reason why I asked to be take off, taken off of uh, the screenings was that they, they just, for two and a half years, there was nothing there. Um, I, I've worked to address that. I think that Mr. Mears indicated that that's a major hurdle. If you can't overcome that hurdle, then you can't move on to the next step. And I worked very hard to come over that hurdle. I'm, I'm proud that I came, overcame that hurdle. And in addition to my parents' condition uh, two years ago when these occurred, that was an issue. That was, I was finally achieving some level of, of um, sobriety and some, uh, uh, restoring a sense of self-worth. I, I drove this plea agreement. I drove it. I drove it pretty hard. I did drive it pretty hard, and I appreciate that you worked an agreement out with that. I drove this plea agreement because I'm at a stage in, in my mind where I need to apologize to my victims. 
I learned things today that I didn't know about the impact on my victims, and I'm sorry for that. And I was going to ask the court as part of my sentencing if it were appropriate. I wanted to, I wanted to apologize to those victims in writing. Should the court find it appropriate for me to guide that through the court for their approval? Um, and now I have more information to do that with. Um, I couldn't apologize to my victims. I couldn't show remorse when I still had a pending criminal prosecution. So we're not here today because I made case law ensuring that people can distribute literature in front of courthouses. We're not here because I made case law about what fighting words are as it relates to disorderly conduct. I'm not here because I've prevailed on 82% of my arrests, which are certainly indicative of misconduct at the police level. We're not here for that. We're not here because of my successes. We're here today because I crossed the line. I don't know if I crossed the line legally. My attorneys think that we have good defenses, but I think that I crossed the line morally. So if there are any followers, uh, first of all, I'll tell you that they don't follow blindly. You heard from Ms. Springsteen, she doesn't agree with everything I say. If anything, I wish I had followed my followers' guidance earlier on. I wish I had listened to them earlier on. Followers aren't following blindly, but in the event that they are following blindly, um, I would hope that they take a look at my successes. I think I have made progress in, in a lot of realms. I hope that they model that. More importantly, I wanted to stand here and tell the court and tell the public who's clearly listening, there are lines in the sand. Those lines may not be legal lines. They might be ethical and moral lines that might pass as legal things, but they might not be right. And that's what I'm here to do today. I, I want to apologize to you, Judge Rudolph. I've not been allowed to do that until now. And still, don't make your address your comments to him. I'm address sorry, your sir. comments to me. It's one of the rules. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to do that. I've wanted to do that. My lawyers would tell you that I've wanted to do that, but they've not allowed me to do that. I want to do that. I want the court to sentence me to write apology letters to my victims today because I do have something to say to them that I think is appropriate. I do, and it's not about them. It's about me. I crossed the line. There are lines. I really hope that people take from this that, that you can negate eight years of good activism with a single stroke. So if I had any followers, then I would assume that as of today, I probably do not really have that many. And that's probably appropriate because I'm not your champion. I'm not the guy. I didn't make it. I couldn't take the pressure. I didn't make it. So what I'm asking the court to do today, I have no objection to a lengthy probation period. I think that I can prove to the court that I'll comply. I've, I've been complying for the last year and a half. I do acknowledge and recognize the severity of my words. Words really do hurt. They really do have a meaning. Even if it may be legal, it may not be right. And that's what I want people to take away from this today. I am standing here before you today asking you to allow me to continue my treatment with Mr. Mears. I think the fact that I'm almost completed with a Denver probation in one case is indicative that I can complete probation. I think that my compliance with pretrial services is indicative that I will comply with the court. I think that my compliance with the Adams County probation where they've taken me from maximum supervision to minimum supervision and even because of my UA history, they've removed me from drug screening. I would have no objection to drug screening, except that it is expensive. It's about three hours drive for me to do a test. And I would ask if the court is able to put me on probation that at some point, once the Denver probation thinks it's appropriate, that it might be transferred down to where I'm living. I'd like to move forward with building my ranch. I can't make commitments to those things. I don't know if I'll be able to pay for it if I'm in custody. I can't commit to contracts. I can't, I'm now in a stuck state and I'm ready to move forward. I'm asking the court to impose a suspended sentence and probation, and I'm willing to accept my bitter pill. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, let me start out with a couple general comments. First of all, I've never heard of Eric Brandt. Um, uh, if he didn't make the uh, sports pages of our local paper, or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, I've not heard of him. 
I have a, it's been two decades probably since I've watched or listened to any local media. Um, I don't know if that's good news for him or bad news for him, but that's the fact. The other general thing I wanted to say is I am, as I think all judges would be, a little bit uncomfortable um, being in this position where the victims in this case are judges. Uh, we are all trained to be hypersensitive about conflicts, and um, this makes me uncomfortable. Uh, but when judges are victims, only judges can impose sentences because only judges have the power to impose sentences. Could we bring a senior judge in here um, to, to have done this case? Sure, but it's the same problem. The senior judge is still a senior judge with judicial powers. Uh, the good news, I guess, is that I'm retiring in four days. And so unlike senior judges who will continue to be senior judges, I will not be a judge after April 30th. I'm not doing the senior judge program. I'm not doing any judging. So maybe this is sort of the best um, accidental solution to this intractable problem of, of judges imposing uh, sentences when victims are judges. Um, the, the, the third thing I want to talk about is these questions that have been raised by various people about um, um, th different theories of criminal punishment. And our statutes, of course, require us to consider all the um, justifications for punishment. Uh, retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation. But I've said this for 30 years from this bench. Uh, I don't, um, of all of those theories, retribution speaks to me more than any of the others. Um, the criminal law is about this social contract that we've all entered into, and I want to talk a little bit about that. I don't want to go on uh, forever. Uh, but um, as I've said before, uh, um, punishment is really about the social contract. People who have violated the social contract have to pay to come back into the fold. And although we do have to pay attention to deterrence uh, and incapacitation and rehabilitation, all of these theories have profound limits for me. In a, incapacitation, you know, murderers have the lowest recidivism rate of anybody, and forgers have the highest. Well, then why don't we send forgers to the penitentiary for life? Incapacitation is not a sensible, at least not a complete theory. Um, deterrence, I have no idea what deters and what doesn't, and there's something unjust uh, to me about punishing uh, Mr. Brandt, because we're worried that somebody who likes him is going to do something. That doesn't seem fair to me. Um, rehabilitation, I have no idea about that. Um, I'm not wise enough to know whether the sentence that I impose today is going to change Mr. Brandt's behavior or not. Um, I've been doing this long enough to, to be surprised. Uh, people that I thought were going to change haven't. People who I thought were hopeless have changed. All I know is that the free will all of us has um, makes these predictions about dangerousness and about rehabilitation, um, about reoffending, really the worst kinds of guesses. At least for me, I can't make these guesses. So the only, the, 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 not the only, but the sentencing theory that makes most sense to me is, is rehabilitation, is, is retribution. How much do I have to punish Mr. Brandt um, so he can come back into the fold? Um, and, and, I, and on this point, uh, you know, we're not just talking about the social compact, our forefathers entered into in 1789. It's not, it's way deeper than that. Um, and, and, and because I'm 
focus on retribution. I focus on the crime that bring people here. That's the only thing that gives me jurisdiction. Uh, what's appropriate to punish Mr. Brandt for what he did? Not for who he is, not for what his followers do, not for what he did in other cases. This is why I don't pay as much attention to criminal history as some of my colleagues. Here's what he did in this case. He told Judge Rudolph's staff, and I know this has been said, but it's worth saying again and again and again during the sentencing. It is my thought that Judge Rudolph should be violently murdered and have his brain splattered on the faces of his children. There's much more to it than that, but I think that encapsulates it. I want to know who in the world thinks that that's okay? It's not Nobody okay. thinks that's okay, including Mr. Brandt. It's not, Your Honor. I'm not asking you if you think it's okay, Mr. Brandt. I know now that you only violates the social contract. It not only violates the law, it violates 200,000 years of human evolution. We are all in this together. There are lines we cannot cross. It's hard for me to say this. I'm an unreconstructed libertarian at heart. There were aspects of this job that were hard for me. I don't trust the government in lots of, in lots of dimensions. Um, but there's one dimension that I not only trust the government in, but I've devoted my life to. And it's enforcing the social contract that says it's wrong for you to tell somebody you're going, to, you're hoping their brains get splattered on their children. And if anybody listening is not offended by that, there's something wrong with you. You are loons if you're not offended by that. And it doesn't matter how many YouTube videos or, or how much press you can get by being loons, you're still loons. And the widespread dis dissemination of lunacy does not change the fact that it's lunacy. Here's what makes it hard for me in this case. Mr. Brandt richly deserves the penitentiary, and I'm going to send him to the penitentiary. But he's, and this happens sometimes, the person who gets sentenced is sometimes not the person who did the crime. They've changed, they've grown. Let me tell you, they've always, they always say they have. Whether they have or not, I don't know. I, I take Mr. Brandt at his word. Um, I believe he's truly sorry for what he did. I was impressed that he talked about how this crossed a moral line. No kidding. I'd like all of you to think about what, how you would feel if somebody with real power, not fake cowardly power, real power like I have, said something like that to you with the power to make it happen, it's terrible. Those of us with real power, not fake cowardly power, um, don't like imposing sentences. This is the worst part of my job. I get no joy sending people to the penitentiary, none. And judges who do, do get joy out of it uh, should retire. Uh, they're psychopaths. Only a psychopath would get joy out of inflicting the kind of pain that I'm about to inflict on you. And I get no joy from it. And only psychopaths would get joy from inflicting the kind of pain on Judge Rudolph and these other judges that you inflicted. Judge Rudolph can take this. When I was thinking about this case over the weekend, I thought, here's what I should do. I should give Mr. Brandt probation on the condition that he and Judge Rudolph go three rounds in the ring.
and I let Judge Rudolph pound you into the into the candles. That's what I would like to do. But unlike you, Mr. Brandt, I can't do everything that I want to do. I'm bounded by the law. I'm bounded by the social contract. And I can't just say anything or do anything. So there are restrictions on what I can do. Um, this behavior deserves the maximum sentence, which I'm not going to impose for several reasons. First of all, it, it was quite meaningful to me to hear that Mr. Brandt has done so well in probation. Um, it, he's a Navy veteran. That means something to me. That means he at one time knew uh, that he had a social contract to defend. And I appreciate his service and he should get some honor for that. Um, also, I think it was hard for him because I take it that this does not come naturally for him to come to the podium and say that what he did was wrong. Um, there's probably nothing any of us ever does other than sentencing people, which fortunately most of you don't have to do, uh, that is more hard than saying we're wrong. And I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Brandt, on, on uh, each of these three counts, you're sentenced to four years in the Department of Corrections, plus a mandatory two-year parole period. These sentences will run consecutive to one another. Uh, and I have 85 days pre-sentence confinement. Is that right, counsel? 85 days? Counsel. Counsel. I'm sorry, Your Honor. 85 days pre-sentence confinement? Yes, Your Honor. 85 days. We'll put that on count one. Fees and costs in the usual felony amounts. Is there restitution? Your Honor, if I could ask to reserve, please. Restitution is reserved for 63 days. I know we have a jillion people um, on for the rest of my docket. I'm going to take 10 minutes and we'll finish it. Mr. Brandt is remanded to the Department Stay of Corrections. Stay strong. Thank Stay you. Strong. Thank you, counsel. I have my Brother. paperwork. We love you, Eric. Be ashamed of yourselves. Be ashamed. Stay strong, man. Love you, Eric. Be ashamed. Stay strong. We love you, Eric. Judging on your your feelings on Trump rights. We love you, Eric. Hey. Stay strong, brother. Damn it. You have to believe. Bullshit. 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 